Okay, so John chapter 8, our text this morning is really verses 37 through 47, but we're backing up into verse 31 to get a bit of the context. Listen to what John writes regarding Jesus' encounter with the Jews again on the last day. I believe we're still here at the last day of the Feast of Booths. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you were seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You were doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies." But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them, because you are not of God. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this morning. Now, I do want to back up just a bit because... There's a lot of important things that sort of uh, take place before we get to this particular passage. Now, some of the things we've seen in the past, again, uh, Jesus is speaking to the Jews, and I believe it is still at the Feast of Booths, at the last uh, great feast that Jesus would actually celebrate before the final one, before the last Passover, where he would be betrayed and crucified. Now, on the last day, we've already seen as the water was being poured out at the base of the altar as a reminder of God's provision for his people in the wilderness, Jesus cried out in John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now remember the water was poured out at the base of the altar to remind the Jews of the rock that followed them in the wilderness. That rock was put there by God to teach them about Jesus Christ. It was put there to teach us. What it teaches us is this, that if you've trusted Jesus this morning, even as the rock was struck by Moses... So Jesus was struck by God for you in his justice, for your sins, that he might free you from God's judgment and that he might give you life that lasts forever. Now when the rock was struck, water gushed out of the rock and that water that came out was a picture of the spirit that Jesus would give to those who believe. As a matter of fact, the spirit that he would give to give you the ability to believe and to walk with him to love him 
and to serve him. It's a reminder that you did not save yourself. You didn't muster up within yourself the ability to trust in the Lord because you were dead in trespasses and sins. You didn't have that ability. You were like these Jews. This is a work that God did. God has saved you by his grace. Now Jesus made another claim, and I again believe it was on that same day, that portion of the woman caught in adultery uh, doesn't appear in the earliest manuscripts in this place, although we do believe it to be an authentic account of what Jesus actually did, what happened, and what he taught. But if you take that out of the way, you still have then the same day. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now again, the reason I believe this happened on the Feast, uh, the feast of Booths was because on, or during that feast, the Jews also lit a lamp, perhaps a series of lamps, during that feast in the treasury. The very place where Jesus was standing when he said what I just quoted, I am the light of the world. And those lamps were lit to remind them of the pillar of fire that the Lord gave the Jews to lead them safely through the wilderness until they arrived in the land of promise. Now Jesus is saying that this lamp was also a picture of him. The Father has given you his Son, uh, not only uh, to be your Savior, but to be your guide, uh, to guide you through this life, to bring you safely through, to show you how to live. Uh, he presents himself as an example of how you are to live. He gives you his word, he gives you his spirit so that you will know what you are to do so that you might make it through this world and arrive safely in heaven. By the way, let me just remind you, that is the only way that you are going to get to heaven. You must follow Jesus. You must follow in his steps. That is the paradigm. That is the example. That is the way. Jesus says he is the way, not only the only way to God, but the only way to heaven. Now, in our passage, I believe it is still the same day. Jesus is speaking now to those Jews that had been listening to him and were willing to listen to him to those who believed his words. He's telling them in our passage, which we began last time, how they could really know that they had believed, how they could know they, they truly had eternal life. And it wasn't just because they believed that they believed. There are, of course, those evidences. And here is that premier evidence in verses 31 and 32. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Now, I do believe Jesus said this um, because it was clear at least to him, not to them, but clear to him, that they really did not believe. They still needed to trust him. They still needed to follow him. And if they did, they would know that what he was saying was true. They would know that they had been set free from death because they would see themselves within themselves that evidence that they were free from the slavery of sin. They would be following him. Now, how did they respond to what Jesus said? Again, last time we saw their response was one of denial. In verse 33, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? You know, one of the greatest obstacles to coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is our unwillingness to admit that we are the slaves of sin that we do need a Savior, that we're not good enough on our own to come to Him. We don't want to admit it. We don't want to admit there's anything wrong with us or that we need a Savior. Well, that's what the Jews were doing. What do you do when you run into a group of people like that when you're evangelizing? When you're sharing the gospel with someone and they flat out deny that what the Bible says about them is true, that they're sinners on their way to judgment? Well, I think you and I should do what Jesus does here. He tells them the truth. You shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. Now, Jesus first tells them their true condition. 
You think you haven't been enslaved? You are, as a matter of fact, right now, slaves. You are the slaves of sin. He says in verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. They were still in that condition in which they came into this world. They were basically in Satan's kingdom. We're going to see in a moment they were Satan's children. And they were bound by sin. Now, how can you know that you are the slave of sin? Well, you can know in the way that these could know, in the way that Jesus pointed out. When you obey sin, you are the slave of sin. When sin has the power to command you and you submit to it, you are basically still its slave. Now, again, I know that raises flags. And we do need to understand Jesus did not mean if you sin at all. Because every sinner believe, uh, sins every day, every believer sins every day. You and I sin every single day. But the difference between, between us and those who are bound in sin, still the slaves of sin, is that we fight against it. We resist it. But they don't. We resist it because there is a part of us, a very large part of us, the real us, as it were, that doesn't want to sin any longer. The Bible says that God has made you a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ by the work of his Holy Spirit in your soul. And because he has, you want to obey. You want to honor him. And so you fight to do exactly that, which is why you never completely surrender yourself to sin. You still sin. I still sin. But we don't do it with a whole heart. We do it with a reluctant heart because we're fighting against sin. And ideally, we want to get to the point where we're not you know, giving in to any sinful actions and the battle for the sin is going on primarily in our hearts and in our minds. So Jesus says to them, you are still the slaves of sin, contrary to your belief that we are not, or you are not enslaved. But what about the first part of their claim? That they were the, the children of Abraham. Jesus now directs his arguments against that claim, how they could know, and how we can know as well, whether or not we are children of Abraham, and by that, Jesus means children of God, those who are saved, those who have been set free from sin, and are now the children of God. Jesus says you can know that that's true of you when you live like Abraham the one who truly believed God, the one actually who listened to him and obeyed him. So let's consider three things. And I realize the introduction was lengthy. Uh, don't let that concern you. We're going to be looking at three points. Okay? How can you know, first of all, that God is your father? Secondly, if he is, how did that happen? How did you become his child? And finally, if it isn't true of you, how you can become his child? So we'll look at each of these just briefly. First of all, how can you know that God is your father? How can you know that you have been adopted into the family of God as Abraham was adopted? I've already told you. You can only know if you live as Abraham lived. God's grace, as you know by now, doesn't leave you in the condition it finds you. God's grace changes your life, and when you see that evidence then you can know that you belong to him. Now, as over against their claim, Jesus first acknowledges that what they said was true, at least at one level, you are Abraham's children. I know you're his descendants, but he says, only according to the flesh, only physically. Again, verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. There is a sense in which that is true. They were bone of his bone, they were flesh of his flesh. They were his offspring. But notice that is where the similarity ended. They may have shared his genes. They may have shared his bloodline. But they didn't share his faith. They didn't share his nature. They didn't share his relationship with God. Now Jesus says that flat out, frankly, to them. How did Jesus know that was true? Was it because he was God in human flesh? Was it because the Holy Spirit revealed that to him? Was it because he knew what was in the hearts and minds of all men? Well, I don't think it was in this case. It was because he observed them 
and saw what they were doing and not doing. He saw their unwillingness to listen to him and to obey him. Jesus again says in verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Jesus was looking at the evidence. You're trying to kill me. That means that my word has really not found its way into your hearts. Now, what is this word that Jesus was telling them? Well, he was telling them, and, and here's where we just kind of briefly survey this particular text, the things he had learned from God. He was giving them the truth that he had heard from his father. I, this is the one you say you love. I'm just telling you what he says, but you don't accept that. You, you hate that. You don't understand it. Jesus says you can't even hear what I'm saying. I want to take a little bit of time here. Just think about this. The word could versus basically the word, uh, you know, the idea of being unwilling. This is talking about ability. In verse 43, he says you, you can't hear it. They don't believe him. So instead of loving him and listening to what he uh, had to say to them because he was sent from God, which they would have done if they were born of God, they hated him and wanted to kill him. Now Jesus asked the question, is, is that what Abraham would do? No. Abraham loved God. Abraham listened to the word of God. Abraham obeyed him and submitted to him. But who is it that would do what it is these people are doing? Well, the devil would. You see, the devil hates God. The devil hates his son. The devil hates the ways of God. The devil hates the kingdom of God. The devil won't listen to God's word, and neither will his children. These Jews were not showing themselves to be the children of God. They were showing themselves to be the children of the devil. That was their true father. Jesus says in verse 44, again, how to win friends and influence people? This isn't the way to do it. Jesus told them the truth. Okay, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Uh, could Jesus make it any clearer? I mean, what is the difference between a child of God, a child of Abraham, and a child of the devil? The difference is a child of God listens to God, but the child of the devil does not listen. Jesus concludes in verse 47, he who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. Again, you are of your father the devil, you are not of God. If you were of God, you would listen. Now, you can know, according to what Jesus says, that you are born again, that you have his spirit living in your heart. You can know that you will see heaven because of this very simple fact. You listen to Jesus and you do what he says because his word finds a place in your heart. And the reason why it does is because you love him. And it's just as simple as that. I mean, it doesn't take, you know, pages and pages and argument after argument. It boils down to this simple argument. Now, God's grace changes your life. It changes it from the inside out. You will not be the same person you were before. You will be growing into the image of Christ because that's what God has determined and because that is what you will want to do because you love him. As a matter of fact, remember on those last Sunday evenings, when at least when, when I was here, we were looking at those particular characteristics that God treasures, and we were looking at, well, why, why should we want to become like this when God says, you know, blessed are the merciful, because they will receive mercy. Well, there's one motive, because... When I show mercy, I know that I will be shown mercy because I'm showing mercy because God has had mercy on me. Another reason is because God says he treasures and values these characteristics. But another reason, and perhaps the most important reason, is because 
I love him, and I want to honor him. I want to become like the Savior whom I love. This is the way he was. And I want, when I pray, to know that God will hear me and he will listen to me, and the Bible seems to point out that if I love him and I'm growing in the image of Christ, that God is going to be more willing to listen to me as I am willing to listen to him. So the Lord gives you that grace when he saves you. He gives you those characteristics, as it were, in their beginnings, in their inception. And then he says to you, cultivate these things out of love for me, to glorify me, to become more like my son, to shine more of the light of my gospel. And as you do that, know that I will listen to you when you pray and I will do exceedingly abundantly beyond all you can ask or think. So there's many blessings for doing these. Now let me just simply ask you here, is this what you see going on in your life this morning? Are you growing into the likeness of Christ? Are you listening to God? Are you obeying Him? Do you love Him? Not perfectly, because none of us do, but at least in some measure, and are you seeking to grow in that grace? Well, that brings us to the second point. If it is true of you, then Jesus says you are a child of God. If this is true of you, let's consider why that's true of you. I mean, how it is you came into the world a child of the devil because you were just like these Jews, and how you are now a child of Abraham, how you are now a child of God. Well, again, I'll point out to you that it wasn't because of you. It wasn't because of anything you did. You do not love God now. You do not listen to God now because that is what you chose to do, although you did choose it, but not on your own. You never would have chosen him except for his grace. The reason why you listen to him, the reason why you love him is because God had mercy on you and we don't want to, to miss that fact when you see the grace of God in you when you see these things going on it's because there was a lot that went into it that was all aimed at you because of God's great love for you and his desire to redeem you and to make you a new creature and to bring you to heaven now Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2 1 that that was not your condition at least a child of God when you came into the world he says you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. That's the way you came into the world. Because of Adam, because of your own sins, you were a child of wrath. Now what, I'm, what Paul is saying here is that you were just like these Jews that Jesus was speaking to. You didn't love him. You didn't want to listen to him. You were going your own way. But God intervenes. Now Paul continues, in this condition... We did the things we should not do in verse 2. You formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. In other words, when you came into the world, you were like the people you see every day out there who aren't in here worshiping the Lord, like the people you see on television, people you see in the movies, the people you see on stage, the people you see playing sports, all who have not received the Lord Jesus Christ, and the vast majority of them have not. You were just like them. Are they okay? No, they're not okay. They don't listen to God, they don't love God, they're not obeying God, and the end for them is going to be hell. That is where you were, that is where I was. Paul, as he writes this in Ephesians chapter 2, basically says this was true of him. It was true of those who were with him. He wasn't saying it was just something unique to the uh, Ephesians. He says in verse 3, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest, which means we came into the world under God's wrath, on our way to hell, and we all would have justly ended up in hell. Okay, that's where we were at. But what changed all of this? It was God. Paul writes in verses 4 through 7, But God, not but you, and not but you saw your need, and but you reached out to Christ, and but you did enough good works in order to commend yourself to God, and God finally accepted you because you were good enough. No, but God intervened. But God, being rich in mercy, 
Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So why are you a child of God now? Why are you a son of Abraham? Unlike these Jews, what happened? God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit loved you from all eternity because they chose to love you from all eternity. Not because you were lovely. Not because they looked ahead and saw how beautiful you were. Not because they looked ahead and saw you were going to choose them. But because of their mercy and grace, they chose to uh, put their grace and mercy upon you. And they conspired together to save you. The Father determined, again in the council between the three persons of the triune God, He determined that He would send His Son for you, out of His love for you. The Son came and He laid down His life for you because He loved you. And the Father and the Son sent the Spirit of God to you to unite you to the Lord Jesus Christ, to change your heart, to quicken you to life. And the Spirit came and He did exactly that because of His love for you. And you know, one thing, again, I'll point out in that text that I just read is that Paul says that because you are united to Christ, you are already in heaven. It's a done deal. You are seated with Christ now because you are in union with him. It's not that he just represents you in heaven. You are connected to him and he is in heaven. Therefore, you are in heaven. And because that is true, one day... Those of us who are here this morning who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, one day we will be in heaven. It is as certain as the fact that Jesus is there right now. And Paul goes on to say, because you are in heaven, united with him, you will be with him forever. And century after century, God will reveal the riches of his love and his grace and his mercy to you in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, it wasn't because of you. It was purely because of him, purely because of his grace. Salvation is from beginning to end the work of the Lord, which is why, of course, you should give him all the glory, but this is also why you should do what it is that he says you should do, which is listen to him, obey him. This is why you will do that. Because he has loved you and he has sent his son and he has changed your heart. So when you know that the Lord has had mercy upon you, when you see the evidence of this love in your heart towards him, towards his word, towards his people, then you can know that he has loved you with this love from all eternity. That's a great blessing. And we need to remind ourselves continually that that is true. Why do we listen? Why do we obey? Well, it's because we want to do it. Because God's changed our nature, but it's also because of his love toward us and the great cost that it cost him in order to save you, in order to bring you into this relationship, in order to bring you to heaven. Uh, he has shown you such love. The only proper response is to love him in return. Now the final point or the final question is this, what if you don't see it? What if you don't see this submission to the Lord? What if you don't see this love for the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, what if you conclude from this that you are not a child of Abraham, that you are not a child of God, then what is it that you can do? What should you do? How can you become a child of God? Well, the only thing that God has given you to do is belief. And remember, belief is more than just believing facts. It's trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he has given you to do. Jesus says in John 3, 16, again, the most famous and familiar verse in all of Scripture, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, verse 23, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
And we also know from Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost to those Jews who said, Sirs, what, sh what should we do? You've just proven to us that we've murdered our Messiah. Now what? What are we going to do? How can we be saved? And he says, repent. The idea of repentance is bound up in the idea of trusting and believing. All of those things are bound together. Now, I, I say this because I want to say this. The Lord does not say to you, first of all, find out if I've chosen you. Go up into heaven and look in the book. If your name is in there, then believe. Uh, it is true that if you believe, he will have chosen you. But you don't have to know that he has chosen you before you do believe. What you need is this, the desire for the Lord Jesus Christ. All you need is to want to be with him, to want him as your savior, as the Lord freely offers him to you in the gospel. All you need is the desire to be free from your sin to be free from its guilt and to be free from its power. That's all you need. And then all you need to do in that desire is to look to him, reach out to him, trust him to save you. And he will save you. So again this morning, this text asks each one of us, who is your father? Are you a child of God? Do you know that you are a child of God because you love Jesus and because you listen to him and you obey his word? Or is your father still the devil because these things aren't true of you? Well, if your father is the devil still, if you have never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, I would simply invite you to do so this morning. If you desire him as a savior, if you want him, he offers himself to you. If you want to be free from your sins, he offers you the power to, to be free from your sins. He will break the power of sin. Do you want to be free from the guilt of sin so that you won't be weighed down into heaven? Jesus promises to forgive you every single one of your sins if you will simply receive that mercy that he offers you this morning. If you will simply look to him in faith. No one who ever has looked to him has ever been disappointed. I think you'll find that for everyone you talk to here this morning who knows and will tell you the same thing. So don't spend another day bound in sin, enslaved to sin, a child of the devil on your way to hell. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to apply these things.